He won't do it. He will not bow to a man or a person, breaking the second law of God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television. Now, it's a program. It is designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And today we study, and we come upon this, Mordecai refuses to bow before Haman. He is ready to die for his faith, and he thinks that he might have to. He thinks that he will. So we'll talk about that and more coming up a little bit later in the program. But right now, Corey's going to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Today we're going to be exploring the halls of the royal Persians and taking a look at festivals of remembrance. All right, festivals of remembrance, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And you studied today. What mm -hmm. did you do? Took a look at Esther chapter 3, buying off the king. Buying off the king, mm -hmm. really, very interesting. Well, we've got them together here, and so this is how it works. Get your Bible guide out and get your Bible out because we're getting ready to go through it and study it and learn from the Word of God. Now here comes Corey with Bible history and archeology span from the Bible. The majority of the Book of Esther takes place in the palaces and royal residences of ancient Persia. So today, you and I are going to take a look at one of the Persian capital cities of Susa to kind of get a feel for where this history took place. The city of Susa was chosen to become the winter capital of the Persian Empire by King Darius the Great. Darius ruled only eight years after Cyrus the Great, with the eight-year interim being filled by Cyrus's son. Darius ruled for 36 years and established three capital cities with royal palaces. He began the famous Greek wars that would be continued by his son, Xerxes, of the Book of Esther. And he had interaction with the people of Judea. The Book of Ezra, chapters 4 through 6, record how Darius honored the decree of Cyrus to allow the people to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. The historical setting for the Book of Esther is the royal palace at Susa built by Darius. And the Book of Nehemiah begins also in the palace complex of Susa. The ruins of Seuss's palace have been excavated. Findings conclude that it was built on top of the ruins of the old temple district. This new royal district had a massive gatehouse, a pavilion, an audience hall, and of course a large palace covering 38,000 square meters. A defining feature of the palace was uncovered fallen in a courtyard by its entrance, glazed brick reliefs. Patterns of warriors, archers, animals, and tribute were immortalized on this brick palace, along with bricks inscribed with Darius's name and passages attesting to his greatness. There was a nine meter wide wall that surrounded the entire complex and was also decorated with brick reliefs. Along with the audience hall that would have seen Esther as she waited to risk her life before the king, Elamite texts have been found that describe Susa as a city of textile production, trading and selling beautifully complex tapestries. In Esther chapter 1, it's recorded that in the now excavated courtyards of the palace were hung extravagant decorative linen tapestries. 
The biblical book of Esther is historians gold, essentially. This is what we want to see preserved because the majority of records that come to us from the ancient world are political in nature or fragmented in nature. So historians are left to piece together the personal lives of the ancient people. And that really is the goal, bringing humanity um, back into history. And so when uh, it, it does happen that every once in a while, something like the book of Esther comes along, but the book of Esther is, uh, is really a perfect specimen of uh, human history. It's not just about politics. It's not just about this, um, this, this saving of the Jewish people. There is so much history just embedded within telling a story that's true from that time period. It's, it really is gold for the historian. I mean, there are, in the first few chapters of Esther, there is a description of the hallways of the royal palace. There is a description of the beauty processes that the women of Persia that were potential uh, queens for the king, what they had to go to. That tells us a lot about their culture. It tells us a lot about their uh, beautician services and, and what kind of technology they had going for them at the time, as well as filling in some of the political gaps when we see how the laws were made and so on. There is wisdom to be found in the power struggles of ancient Persia and the Persian Empire. King Ahasuerus has recovered from the slap rendered through Queen Vashti. He has set in motion the effect of an empire-wide beauty pageant, resulting in a new queen, Esther. Esther has kept quiet with the king about her origin. He has no idea that Esther is actually a young Jewish woman coming to him out of living in exile with her people in this ancient empire. The king's main man, Haman, demands worship. But Mordecai, Esther's uncle, puts into practice the second commandment of God. He refuses to bow. Esther 3, verses 1 through 11. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened, when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman, to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with rage but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ohasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ohasuerus, they cast pur, that is, the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ohasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. 
And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. As you read this scripture, you become fascinated with the way things are developing because the story is continuing and we're just isolating scripture in the story as we move along. Now, our Bible guide has the four points that we've included here. We're going to cover three today for time reasons. But get the Bible guide because the Bible guide has that fourth point and we encourage you to get it and to read it and make sure that it's part of your life. Very important. Original documents and uh, original copy every single month we have for you. This is Esther. And Esther is an amazing book. And it's fascinating. And we have a couple of power brokers here. We've got Haman. And we've got Mordecai. And there's a struggle going on. And this is fascinating. Now, Haman hates Mordecai because he would not bow to him. Mordecai went in and he, and the king exalted Mordecai. Esther is the queen. And so he goes out and he says, I am great. I am wonderful. I am excellent. But Mordecai, I will not bow before the king or before uh, Haman. This is a fascinating read. And as we take a look at this, I find wisdom in the power. What am I talking about? Wisdom in the power. And then we're also reading Esther chapters 3 to 5. And if you read that, you'll keep up with us in the Bible. So that's a great thing to do. But we're going to focus today on Esther chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. And as we look at this, understand what God is doing, because what he's doing is fascinating. So the scripture tells us something interesting. We look at Esther chapter 3, and we look at verses 1 and 2. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman. He's the son of Hamadatha, and he's the Agagite. Uh, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gates bowed. They paid homage to Haman. And so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow. He would not pay homage. Not because he didn't like him, but because the second commandment of the law. You see, Mordecai refuses to disobey God. Mordecai is a Jew. He shows courage in the midst of great pressure. And this is important for you and I to understand today in the world in which we live. We cannot change our ways. When we have dedicated our life to Christ, when we have dedicated our ways to serving the God who we love, we can't change our ways just because now it's more, uh, it's better to do it this way or do it that way. And we just can't do that. We've got to stay faithful to God, our Lord. And that's important as we do. Well, Mordecai did, and it infuriated Haman. And so we learn in Esther chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gates, they said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily that he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. He had explained the law. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to Haman, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands upon Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur. That is the lot. They played the, 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 the dice, if you would before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. They're looking for a time to kill the Jews. And so Mordecai creates deep problems simply by being faithful to God's law. God's ways offend the ways of man. And this is the way it works, beloved. God is trying to explain to us if we stay faithful to him and if we love him, he will reward us 
But man's ways are consistently trying to go against God. And there is this great struggle between mankind, which is motivated by Satan, and between God, which is motivated by God. And this struggle takes place. And we recognize it. And we need to see it and understand. Now, some people don't. But if you recognize it, you know. Verse 8 and 9 of chapter 3, Then Haman said to Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people of all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws are different from all the other people's. And they do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. It's not fitting. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work. And I to bring it actually into the king's treasuries. Wow. He's going to pay for this. The king is coaxed and he's convinced to set a decree against the laws of the Jews in his kingdom. Now, see, Satan uses all the forces necessary from man's earth to destroy us. Now, be sure you read point four in the Bible guide today because it gets more interesting. This is the setup, and this is the story we are in the midst of. And the law is made. The king doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't understand what's happening. He doesn't understand that Esther is the queen. She's Jewish. He doesn't get it. And so now we have this tremendous dilemma that takes place. And I want to tell you something. This sets up the greatest deliverance of time, one of the greatest deliverances of all time. And I want to encourage you. God will deliver us from the evil day. Whether the day is today, tomorrow, or yesterday, he will deliver the believers in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, hold to God's word, stay to the word of God, stand fast and trust the Lord. Very important for you to do as we consider this today. One thing that I absolutely love about Judaism is that despite all odds, they have kept their culture alive and they have kept uh, different feasts and festivals that were instituted thousands of years ago. And here in the book of Esther, we have one, Purim. So we're going to take a look at that festival right now. Every year in the Jewish month of Adar, corresponding with our February or March, our Jewish brothers and sisters have celebrated the festival of Purim. Set as an ordinance in Esther chapter 9, Mordecai and Esther decreed that these festival days were to be days of feasting, rejoicing, and of sending gifts to one another and the poor, because during those days the Jews got rid of their enemies. That was the month when their sorrow was turned into rejoicing and their mourning into a holiday. This celebration is noted as one of the noisiest and most cheerful of Jewish feasts. It is commemorated today by a small fast, the reading of the book of Esther, during which hissing, booing, feet stamping, and twirling of noisemakers accompany the reading of Haman's name to figuratively blot out his name, and cheering accompanies the reading of Mordecai's name. To celebrate God's deliverance of the Jewish nation, gifts, often of food, are still exchanged, and special gifts are given to the poor. Skits are arranged and played by children, and special triangular-shaped cookies are made to represent Haman's hat. This joyful festival is centered around God's deliverance brought to the Jewish nation through Esther, a few generations after Persian King Cyrus's original decree of freedom. This beautiful orphaned woman we know as Esther, probably a name given to her to compare her with the pagan goddess Ishtar, was originally named Hadassah, meaning Myrtle. Interestingly, Myrtle is a popular component for building the booths of the Feast of Tabernacles, which celebrates the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt and God's faithful protection in the wilderness wanderings. 
God's protection and deliverance is proven in so many ways. Myrtle, or Hadassah, the beautiful bride adorning God's deliverance, has been worthy of remembering for thousands of years. The Bible is So Cool is the title of a 46-page booklet by Robin High School about the amazing facts of God's Word. Is there external proof of some of the remarkable stories in the Bible? Is there evidence of those stories? And does the Bible report on stories that are historically sound? The Bible is So Cool tells you. This booklet is ready for you now. For a gift of $5 or more above your regular giving, write and ask for The Bible is So Cool by Robin High School. In the United States, write to us at Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And in Canada, write to us at Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. Or you can order on our website at www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's biblediscoverytv.com. Ask for your copy of The Bible is So Cool. Thank you for staying with us as we continue to read through the Bible in one year. That's a big deal. It you is know, a reading big deal. Through, reading through the Bible in one year is it's a, a big... It's a wonderful accomplishment. It, it is a wonderful accomplishment, but it's a big deal. <laughs> and I've done it several times, and I'll tell you what, it's exciting. But anyway, uh, next time on Quick Study Television, I'm going to speak about this. The king is unaware that he has made a law against the Jews... Oh my goodness, they become enemies of the state there. And uh, they're going to be destroyed, but God steps in. We'll talk about it next time on Quick Study Television. Now, what did you study today? Well, I studied Esther chapter 3, but before I talk about that, I just want to say any of you that heard Rod say, well, I've read through the Bible several times, and you feel really sad inside because you haven't, or maybe you've just joined us, maybe you're just tuning in for today, please don't feel bad. This is your opportunity to begin now and you can work towards it it is a wonderful goal you will never ever ever regret it not one ounce one second of your time with god in the bible um is absolutely uh, i i didn't mean to say that to make people feel bad but nope. i'm just i'm excited because i know you are that. and you learn something new every year so that I just do. proves that the bible is a totally different book it is a the living word is what it's called all right so i'm talking about buying off the king because this man haman he he's pretty sneaky pretty sly and he comes cleverly to the king with a plot to exterminate the jews of that time in that kingdom and we read about it in esther 3 verse 9 if it pleases the king let a decree be written that they be destroyed they meaning the jews and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. Well, Haman's offer to give the crown, that's 10,000 talents of silver. That's about 375 tons of tons. silver that we're talking about. Tons. A lot of silver. To pay for an empire-wide extermination. This probably encouraged Ahasuerus, whose reserves had been depleted by the war with the Greeks. Now... The magnitude of the gift is apparent if you use Greek historian Herodotus's estimation of the income of the Persian king. Such a gift from Haman would represent over half of the annual income of the Persian Empire. That's half the income? Yes, that's significant. Haman was very rich, very powerful. Now it appears in verse 11 that the king may have refused the offer because here's what he said. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as it seems good to you. So we don't wow. really know whether the king took the money or whether the money he left or, it with and Haman. the people are given to you. Mm -hmm. You do what do you want to do with it. 
Isn't that wow. interesting? That is interesting. Hey, do I have time to read a couple of, of notes? Sure, yeah, we got a couple okay. minutes. Go ahead. Good, good, good. I love this one. It came from Steve. It came on the top of our letterhead that we send to everybody, and he's got written here. I thank God for quick study throughout the years. As the song says, give me that old-time religion. It was good enough for Paul and Silas, and it's good enough for me. And he signs it, happy in Christ, Steve. <laughs> okay, Steve, old-time religion, very that good, gives, excellent. Gets right to the point. That's right, that's, that's right. right. And uh, then we have who? Brenda, and this came on, the, um, uh, on our website through email. I want to tell you what a blessing your show has been to me. I love going through the Bible with all of you. I believe this is my ninth time going through the Bible with you. That's awesome. And I have loved every minute of it. That's awesome. That was my part added. <laughs> Saying to Brenda, that's no, awesome that Brenda, she has gone through it nine times. Thank you. And thank you for the many letters we get and, and writing to us. Thank you so much. Let me give you our phone number. It's 724-733-8336 in the United States of America. In Canada, it's 519-940-8338. You can call us at any time. And ask questions or get people to pray for you or whatever, you can write to us at P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668. You can ask for the Bible Guide, which is available for you. Also, you can write to us at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. That's in Canada right here in the studio. And remember this, we're on the internet at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Remember the TV, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. The king became a deadly enemy of Esther, and he didn't even know it. The reason is simple. He trusted his man, Haman. Haman took his newfound authority and used his own advantage. When Mordecai refused to break the law of God, he was charged with treason. This is the reason for Esther. She is set in the Persian kingdom for such a time as this. God has a way of putting us in the right time at the right place for the right reason. We would be wise not to interfere with that, but to follow God's cues and learn the will of God daily. Somebody said to me once, how can you believe a God you can't see? But I understand and I can see God working in other people. He rose again 2,000 years ago after he was killed on the cross and 500 people plus saw him. And the truth is, as he ascended to heaven, he said, if you believe in me and you accept me as Lord of life, then I will come into your heart and change you. Do that today, accept Jesus today. And when you pray, write to us and tell us you've done that. We have some information for you.